Hello and welcome everyone to a new episode of Tawhid and the Spiritual Unity of the Three Principles. Um, today I have uh, an amazing guest with us, uh, Marina Gallen. And uh, I think most of you know Marina, but for those of you who doesn't know Marina, I think you should you know check her out. She's been sharing this understanding for years. Uh, she's you know uh, mentoring one-on-one uh, -on -one clients, group coaching, uh, and and coaching uh, people in business as well. Um, and uh, we had Marina actually on this show, but it was like two years ago, I guess, uh, when uh, Harry. Derbitsky was, uh, you know, uh, hosting the show with me. And um, it's just amazing uh, to always, you know, listening to Marina talk and, and being touched by what she's sharing. And uh, the place where she's sharing from is, is absolutely pure. And, and you, you will experience it for yourself today uh, here live on, on Tawheed. And for the people who are going to watch the recording. So it's always good to have you with us, Marina. And uh, the topic today, actually, is um, I, I'm going to have to read this. Uh, the one question to catapult you out of doubt and into freedom. Um. Actually, Marina picked this, and um, and I'm um, I'm so looking forward to hear, uh, you know, and explore this with you, and uh, so good to see you. Thank you, thank you, Omar. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you again. We we have talked every now and then and connected every now and then, but man, this feels like a treat having more time with you. It really does. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Well, so the reason why I chose that title for our gathering here today is because I find myself in a moment in life in which I have experienced a lot of doubt. I have had to make a lot of hard decisions and I, I have found myself struggling and pushing forward and pulling back and and a lot of people around me, due to the circumstances we are immersed in, are experiencing the exact same thing. And I had the blessing of having a conversation with a good friend of mine. And we were exploring this, right? Doubt and freedom and how, how when we are in doubt and we are unable to choose, we feel constricted, we do not feel free, right? Yes, <laughs> and, and, and we experience so much frustration in that moment. And then our exploration continued and we went deep into just how free we are in life, just how allowed we are by life. Like we are so trusted that we are given the freedom to choose our own suffering, right? <laughs> our own reasons to suffer. I mean, consider that. You choosing how to suffer and why to suffer is allowed, is completely, you are so trusted. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, go for it. Go for it. No problem. You will not be punished for it. You will not, I mean, the sky is never going to break open and a finger is going to come out and say, that is not the right way to suffer. You are doing it wrong. Those are not good reasons. Like, it's just allowed. And if it's allowed, it must be because ultimately it's okay. And that got us to see, well, even if you choose to suffer for the rest of your life and for every single minute, you're not, you're not getting it wrong. You're, you're, I mean, there is an invitation to not suffer, but it's okay. It's so okay that it's allowed. So we were playing with all that. And we started talk, talking about, well, these moments of, of painful decision-making. And talking about, well, if we choose one way or another, 
it, it is still allowed, right? <laughs> Otherwise, we would not be in that dilemma. And we were remembering the words of a spiritual teacher who says something that sounds really strange when you first hear it, but bear with me. So what he says is, if there is a choice, there is no clarity. So in other words, if it looks like you have a choice, you are not in a state of clarity. If you were in a state of clarity, there wouldn't be a choice to make. The best option would be self-evident. Does that make sense? Yes, okay. But the fact is that we do get confused and we do uh, get um, anxious about our decision-making. Now, the good news is that when there is confusion and we know there is confusion, then there is clarity, at least about the confusion, right? So, so we are not in absolute confusion. There is clarity, at least about that. And that clarity allows for a space and time in which we can take a step back and not necessarily make a decision until the best decision becomes self-evident. The right line of action arises for itself, right? Which is one of the great lines of the Tao. Can you remain still until the right action arises by itself? That is the wonderful invitation. But so many times in life, we are pressed to make a decision. And no matter how long we wait, it does not seem to arise by itself, right? And so the one question that catapults me out of freedom, out of confusion, out of doubt and into freedom is if I knew with absolute certainty, without the shadow of a doubt, that whatever I choose, I could not get it wrong, what would I choose? Like, if I knew that choosing A, I could not get it wrong. And choosing B, I could not get it wrong. Then what would I choose? You see, because a lot of what keeps us restrained in those moments, a lot of what stops us is precisely the fear of getting it wrong. Right? But what if we can't? What if we can't get it wrong? And that opens up a whole new level of freedom because if you can't get it wrong, well then the preference seems, seems to have a different taste to it, right? Now, consider this on top of that. Every single decision we make makes possible new possibilities. I know it sounds a little cacophonic, but okay. that makes possible more possibilities. And if I don't take that step, I will never see the possibilities that taking that step made possible, right? So for example, if I decide to go to the party, one set of possibilities will be available. But if I decide not to go to the party, another set of possibilities will become available. Yes? So every step I, I take offers me a chance to stop and reconsider the possibilities again. So the possibilities that I was aware of in position number one are not the possibilities that are, uh, that are available in position number two, right? And the possibilities that are available in position number two are different from the possibilities that become available in position number three. So we can't know the ramifications of every single one 
of our decisions. So we can take one step, look at the ramifications, and then take the next step. We do not need the whole plan in advance. It would be a very, very limited plan if we were to consider it all from position number one. Yes? So that is one thing to consider. But another very important thing to consider is that in most decisions, the possibility also exists of taking that step back. It's not like we are getting married to every single one of the decisions we make. We can change our minds. I mean, even if mar in even marrying, <laughs> we can change our, our minds, right? So, so if we take that one step and of and all the possibilities that arise, suddenly, oh, they are not so appealing anymore, we can always go back. No, like Led Zeppelin says, there's still time to change the road you're on, right? <laughs> but in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. Third thing to consider, we are adaptive beings. We are resourceful beings. So if I make decision A and everything goes to hell, I will be able to deal with it. I will find the resources, the internal resources to deal with it. Or at least I will find the internal resources to learn from that, from that experience. And so, even if it was the worst decision of my life, the possibility of harvest in terms of understanding, in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience are endless. We cannot get it wrong. We can't. I remember talking to George Pransky once and, and <clears throat> we were in a group and someone was playing with the subject like, right, okay, if we can wait, then we wait until the right choice is obvious. But what if we have to choose now and we don't have clarity? And George's response was absolutely spot on. He said, if you have to take the decision now and you don't have clarity, then it doesn't matter what you choose. It has no importance whatsoever. We will see. So on a cosmic level, what if you can't get it wrong? What if you couldn't get it wrong? What would you choose then? Is this making sense? I'd love to hear you guys a little. Marina, wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, seriously. <laughs> this has been amazing uh, so far. Anyone who wants to ask a, uh, a question or share anything, uh, please unmute yourselves. Divyash. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marina. You thank guys you. are discussing time. You guys are discussing time zones. Mine is 521 a.m. in Sydney. I, I didn't so... want to bring you up, Divyash, you know, but uh, <laughs> there you go. There I, you I'll go. floor <laughs> you guys. I'll floor you guys with my time. Uh, and yet you but, made the decision to be here because you couldn't get it wrong, did you? <laughs> but Marina, let me, given your topic, let me tell you how I made the decision to be really? here was simple. I do not put on the alarm because I think about it. I, I, I won't sleep knowing in a funny way that, oh God, I have to wake up at five for Marina Galan and Omar's uh, thing. So I leave it up to universe to just say, oh, 
if you're up, you're up. If you're not, you're not. And funny enough, 90% of the time when there is an intent um, to to attend, whether it's you or whether it's Christine Heath or whoever is the time zones of US or Europe, I have woken up and I just wash my face, lie back in bed and listen. And, find it, and the mind has been cleared because of the rest of five and a half or six hours sleep. It, it is actually quite a beautiful way to listen to you uh, and, and Omar. And so anyway, to, to, the, to what you're saying, it was just magnificent. I needed to hear that because a whole lifetime of conditioned, uh, we, we have a saying in my Indian culture, I come from Indian origin, but I was born in Kenya and lived in England and U.S. and now in Australia. In our culture is use your head. Use your head. And then subconsciously or consciously, you were made to feel extremely guilty if you made wrong decisions, uh, whether it's financial or, or relational or any life, but generally, because of the nature of values of the culture mm -hmm. I come from, it's either, it's how much you're worth, how much money can you add to the coffers, how much can you be upright citizen in the community, um, and I managed to smash all that and be in totally black sheep mode, uh, and totally, like, I mean, I, I, but what I'm trying to say is, in hindsight, each and every one of the so-called bad decisions has led, in hindsight, to, first of all, little things, whether it's 12-step or you Carl Jung or this, just trying to understand yourself in, in, a, in a way where the clarity of the next one overrode in a funny, but didn't discard the last seeking. And one of them, five, six, five and a half years ago, led to the three principles. Now, I'm no ex expert. I was going to use the wrong word. I'm no master of these principles or anything. I succumb to my, my self-judgment, my this, my that, all the time, all the time. And just up to like yesterday, decision. Do I get this equity loan or do I not? Do I do this? Or how will it affect who, how, when, why? Constant thinking and thinking. And what you just say with George Pransky's reference also is lack of clarity, it, it will be all right. Because from your past ex experience, not one has led you ultimately to a sinkhole of despair. In fact, each one has led to an opening of your own being, peeling off the onion little by little, right? It has <laughs> led to something else. And each something else has relieved you even marginally of despair, of self-judgment, of criticism, and the need to belong to that same society which tells you you're wrong because you're opening up to a much bigger society of people like you, everybody, who are who become more curious with wonder and awe in living. Now it all sounds wonderful here, and I'll probably revert back to my crap in one sec in one second. But I'll tell you one thing: having heard you and and Omar opening, and there are chances that I will come from a more open, wondrous, present love than my normal fear-ridden. Uh, black and white thinking or despair or wrong decision, what will happen, what will happen, worry, fear, constricted versus expansive. Thank you for that, Marina. Thank you. Thank you, Divyesh. So I, I don't think it's it's particular to India, this, this education in fearing yeah. and terrified of making a mistake, right? Because that's how we are graded in our school system. You know, you yeah. make a mistake. That's right. That's it. It's as simple as that. And so we learn to be terrified of making a mistake, terrified to the point of, of being frozen in action, right? Oh, but here's yeah. the thing. So when my kids were, were little, at some point, 
I realized that I was trying to protect them from making mistakes and I was trying to avoid any suffering. But then I started thinking about, well, what, what happens to people that don't experience any suffering and any frustration and, and don't make any mistakes? And they become spoiled brats. They become, you know, lack of empathy. They become inhumane. They become cold. Do I want my kids to grow up like that? If I, if I don't, if I want them to develop into fully grown human beings, I have to allow them the whole human experience. I don't need to manicure it for them. I don't need to micromanage it for them. I have to allow them absolute freedom in experiencing absolutely everything. I do, however, get to be a companion for them in all that kaleidoscope of experiences. I do get to love them through all of it. But this is not about trying to avoid anything, right? So Simon Sinek says that there is absolutely no learning that comes from success. All learning <laughs> comes from failure, right? Okay, so. So we need failure, but we need to reframe our understanding of failure and mistakes in order to be able to harvest from them, in order to stop being afraid of them and, and become fully and absolutely free to commit mistakes without judgment, without shame, without guilt, so that we can harvest from them. So listen to this, Divyesh. Yeah. The one day, the one day that changed my motherhood 180 degrees was the day that I sat my children down and I told them very seriously, I need you guys to understand something. I am a mediocre mother on my best days. Do not expect anything else. And they were stunned, you know, like, what are you talking about? And I said, just bear with me. I am a mediocre mother on my best days. And I have been trying to pretend that I am perfect for the last few years. And I am yeah. done with that. It has caused too much stress and it has brought nothing good. So from now on, I am going to demonstrate my mediocrity to you. And they were a bit terrified and a bit taken off. And now this is what happened. That statement has allowed me to make mistakes, share them with my kids in an open, light, fun way, and look for the harvest in them together with them, instead of me trying to hide them, trying to, oh, let's not let nobody find out. And, and create a system in which whatever I am trying to hide in the depths of me comes back at four in the morning to haunt me, you know, yeah. and with shame yeah. and guilt in my ear. So from that day on, I have made an effort. It's less of an effort now, but it was really difficult at the beginning to sit down with them and share with them my mistakes of the day in a lighthearted way. You know, like, you guys will not believe how I lost it today. You are going to get a kick out of this. And I tell them how I messed up. But then I tell them how I corrected. And what I did, you know, like, last week I was telling them, man, I spoke to my brother on the phone and I completely lost my nerve and I yelled and I said some horrible things and... But well, 15 minutes later, I called him and I told him, I'm so sorry, that will never happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, all this exercise, Divya's, has allowed them to become free to make mistakes and yeah. has allowed them to share their mistakes with me again in a lighthearted way and to explore the possibilities of what we can learn from them, to harvest from them. And that has brought us so close together. 
we have an amazing relationship in which we can talk about everything because there is no fear of being judged. Yeah. There is fear of being accused. Of course, now their friends want to come talk to me. <laughs> they want to have dinner here and talk about their mistakes <laughs> because it's a space in which they feel free to do so, right? Now, it's not always easy because sometimes I mess up big time and I am deeply ashamed of what I do. Regardless, oh. I wake up the jester in me and I come back to the table and I share again. Now, around the time that that was happening in my life where I made that switch, I was, I was going through some difficult things and it was incredibly difficult to share those things with them. Incredibly difficult. And I had no idea of how to go about it. And so I took it further and I said, okay, I, I, I challenged myself not to share only with my children, but with my students, with my clients, with people around me, just share. And a lot of people started questioning me, you know, like, what, what are you confessing your sins to us? But that made me think about the actual sacrament of confession and what it yeah. was originally about and how originally it, it was about communion, right? Confession. It's about finding common ground, a common ground in which we all know we all fail and we will all keep failing for the rest of our lives. Nobody is going to become better and not failing than us. So we bring forward our sins, our mistakes, the ways in which we have erred to find common ground with our human fellow beings. And when the other meets us lightheartedly, lovingly with, oh, well, that's how you messed up today. I'll tell you about mine. Hold on for a second, hold your heart. Right, and, I, and then we can harvest from them because guilt and shame are not very expansive states of yeah, mind. Yeah. Right? They are not very, I don't know, uh, high levels of consciousness. Yes. So we, we, we need to find ways in which we lift ourselves out of those states and into understanding, into compassion, into embracing our humanity. Our humanity, highlighting the fact, the gift that we can actually see, oh, I messed up. And and try to not do it again, knowing that we will, right? Yeah. I, I, a couple of years ago, I started interviewing what you would call, I guess, quote unquote, powerful people, right? Because I became really interested in the subject of power. But what I was really interested in was their mistakes. So I would ask them, what has been your greatest mistake so far? And the question would at first catch them off guard, but every time, every time their shell and their mask would fall off at some point and they would share from their hearts in the most beautiful, loving way about their greatest mistake and why, why it had been so valuable in their lives. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. That is how we learn. That is how we become through harvesting from experience. So and, you can't yeah. get it wrong. What if you can't get it wrong? What will you choose then? And that immediately connects you to a deeper part of you that knows what it wants without questioning the consequences, the right consequences, rationally speaking. Yes. Yeah. It, 
it's it's the fear of consequences which led to so many constriction led decisions i mean in hindsight and still can it's not way nobody's i'm not out of the woods no saint no saint here but what what it is is in during the covid times we I had all the time in the world and all the time to wake up at 2 a.m. because there was no time as such. We were all locked in here in, in Australia. Um, so there wasn't a concept of, oh, I have to wake up by this or I have to do this. And I entered the world of a, a wisdom tradition of India, which is quite principle. It's universal in a way. The Bhagavad Gita, of, uh, of uh, it's, a, it's a mythological, yet based in, through places, I, 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 but it is wisdom. And one of the things, one of the pure tenets of this was the Krishna, the Godhead, telling the charioteer about his decision not to fight the, the evil army of his cousins and uncles because he felt he was going to kill the whole lot, his old relatives and everything. And that is what the Gita is, 18 chapters of, radically showing up and don't worry because I am wholeness itself. And at the moment, this wholeness is saying, in your confusion, the decision to overcome the hundred forms of archetypal evil versus your strength is needed, apparent, and must be done in radically showing up. Something like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it was one of the most, I the COVID thing turned this into one of the most learning experiences, not in a book or idea or thinking sense, but something stuck, like show up, engage, and one way, whichever way the dice falls, and it hasn't fallen in my way for a long time, somehow the other you're still here, persevering in right presence with you, with Omar, with Judy, with Christine, with George, with all this. And somehow you're still looking for resonance, knowing that you have it within you, this resonance of clarity, which is possible. And if not, what you just beautifully summed up, that at least you are clear about not being clear. And therefore, uh, one way or the other, you'll be fine. That's, and I, and it, I don't have to resort to my head for reassurance. I can resort to my heart for showing up. So thank you, Marina, for everything. And and knowing, Divyesh, that, oh, thank God, we have common sense, right? I mean, it's yes. not like debating whether we jump out of a plane with a parachute or without a parachute, right? It's like common sense. And common sense is there, and it's on your side. So you don't need to microanalyze all the possibilities going forward <laughs> for that decision. You can you can trust common sense, right? Like, should I call him? Should I not call him? Well, I can't get it wrong. I want to call him, but you know that if you call him, it's gonna go. You know, it's gonna cause yeah. so much suffering. It's not common sense. No, just don't. Right? And, yeah. And it's, do everything. There, there is our attachments and our conditioning but there is also common sense and we can rest assured that it is there and that it is working for us it's on our side yeah yeah thank you Divyash. that was beautiful thank you thank you thank you Divyash. that was beautiful I i'm i'm loving this conversation so far and uh what I'm hearing from this is that, um, well, this is maybe something that you haven't said, but I heard it this way, that there is no, uh, that there is no wrong you're doing, even it's it, it seems like it's wrong in this world, but but there is nothing that you do that is, you know, wrong. You, you well, learn. <laughs> yes, we can do things that are wrong without a doubt. I mean, historically, I can pull up 
five names right now, right? Of, of, of wrongdoings. But in the ultimate scale of things, those are the experiences that catapult us in learning, in understanding, that bring the, the most fertile opportunities for expanding our understanding. Like what we can learn from historical events of clear wrongdoing, right? Or if I go and start punching my kids, it's a wrongdoing, yes. Can we learn from it? Yes, but mm. but it goes beyond that. You know, like Divyesh was saying, the, the tradition of use your head, right? Use your head. I, what I tell my kids every time they leave the house, every time they go out, every time they are caught up in a conundrum, but what I tell them is use your wisdom. Mm. And I am trying to point them to a deeper space in them that uses the head and uses the heart and uses the mental resources that are available to us, mm. but not only the head. You see, so use your wisdom. Wisdom when you are truly connected and aligned with it. I don't, I don't think it, it would be very often that it would guide you to hurt. Mm. You see, there are, so there, is a, there, <clears throat> there is a teacher that says that wisdom is always kind. And I don't, I don't find that that is true superficially because it can look really confrontational. It can look really unkind. It can look like you are making someone wholly responsible, but it, there can be kindness in that as, as well. Does that make sense? It, yeah, absolutely. It does. Like to me, um, that, that goes deeper than what it seems in that moment you're having that wisdom because it, it might seem un unkind in that moment but when after a while in hindsight you see the kindness of it that it was there to right. you know to show you something if you have i don't know a, a son that is abusing drugs and is stealing your money and is and you keep enabling that with kindness well that's not being very kind right if you cut him out and suddenly make him fully responsible for every one of his actions and the consequences of his actions. And it, says, it might look like unkind. You know, you call mother detached from mm -hmm. her feelings or whatever. But at a deeper level, it is incredibly kind, allowing someone to live the consequences of their decisions. As I was saying with my kids, listen to your wisdom you make the decision i will walk with you mm. through the consequences of your decisions i will not rescue you from them because then you will not harvest yeah yes yeah me gusta beautiful <laughs> but ultimately at the largest scope we can't get it wrong yeah because every spiritual ground for for harvest of wisdom yeah and that's what i meant when i said you know we, we are not doing anything wrong like we are not getting it wrong uh on a, on a deeper level maybe on a uh, physical level or superficial level it seems like it's um, wrong um, but it's really not it's yes and we can bring into the equation now innocence yeah I, I mean Marina I've heard that Sidney Banks uh, the first time he entered and he gave a, a talk in a prison the first words that came out of his mouth uh, you're all innocent And it's true. It's just that it's true at a very deep level, right? Yeah, yeah. 
if we bring innocence to the table, the fact of innocence, the truth of innocence, there is no wrongdoing. And so we would need to consider the, the concept of sin in its original meaning, which was missing the point, missing the mark, misunderstanding. Right? You, you didn't understand what this was about, pat, pat, pat. But if we learn from it, it can bring us to the next level. Hmm. 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 And and if we don't learn from it, we're gonna get again this not just you know this um you know uh, uh, Doctor Bill Perry called them love letters um until we see or read the message hopefully right because they will get louder and louder and louder yeah and, and there is there is something that you know like um i think it's a quote or something that we, we stumble across truth every day and we we just you know uh get up and do like we haven't stumbled across anything well sid sid banks and pretty much every teacher in every tradition, they point to the fact that truth is ever present, right? So it's it's always here, yeah. waiting patiently for our senses to grow fine enough to see it, hear it, perceive it, but it's here. Like I have had glimpses of truth looking at my dog play looking at a sunrise, um, listening to a babe, to a toddler speak. I, you, can, you can get a glimpse anywhere because of anything. Mm -hmm. That means that it's there. We don't stumble upon it. We, we are immersed in truth. Yeah. We are just, it's just covered by our own ideas, by our, by our own conditioning, by our own beliefs. Mm -hmm. And at any given moment in time, that, that can rip open and we get a glimpse of truth. And that opens up the doors to a completely new reality. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the quote attributed to Lao Tzu, it is in discussion whether it is actually Lao Tzu's or not. But the quote attributed to Lao Tzu, whenever the student is ready, the teacher appears, right? So it, it's, it's not that if you're in the middle of a desert and suddenly you're ready, someone is going to appear next to you. Mm. <laughs> no, it's that when you're ready, you'll see it because it's everywhere. Yeah. Now, the second part of that quote, which is rarely quoted, is... When the student is truly ready, the teacher disappears. Mm. Well, if it's if it's unknown, you can uh, steal it, Marina. It'll be yours. No, no, no. <laughs> <clears throat> but you see, so. <clears throat> when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yes. When the student is truly ready, the teacher disappears. Mm. Why? What is that pointing? What do you mm. hear in that? You um, you wake up to who you truly are. Uh, the best teacher. The ultimate teacher. Within. The only teacher. Do you see? Yeah. And then you realize that you have been teaching yourself all along. And something in you is in debate with teaching and learning. Right? But truth is always here. Otherwise, it would not be true. Mm. Beautiful. There is a 
a really cool haiku. You know haikus, the Japanese uh, poems? <clears throat> there is a really cool, cool haiku by Kikaku. <laughs> I love saying that. I love how my mouth feels like it's laughing when I say Kikaku. <laughs> so Kikaku, this, this haiku says, so beautiful. The blind child guided by his mother admires the cherry blossoms. It's a beautiful oh. image, right? The blind yeah. child guided by his mother admires the cherry blossoms. Now, it seems to me that it points to many things in life, but one of the things it points to is how in every moment, in different aspects of our lives, we are either being the blind child who is being guided. In other areas, we are being the mother. We are being the one called to guide. And in other areas, we are being the cherry blossoms. We have integrated our understanding and it is manifesting in us, in our, in our mm -hmm. simple being without needing to do anything. But in any moment in our lives, there are areas in which we are being all and inwardly, we are being all to ourselves. Like uh, when Sidney Banks said, uh, I think in the missing link, uh, when the blind start seeing and when the dead uh, starts hearing. Yes. Yes. Beautiful. And he, also, he also says, and why why don't some people, why are some people not able to hear and listen? Because they're not ready. That's it. There is no, they're just not ready, mm. right? Spira asks, how long does it take for the apple to fall from the tree? So it depends on how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about this moment now, or we can talk about the beginning of the universe. <laughs> and anything in between. It takes the time it needs. There you go. It takes the time it needs. Mm. But the expansion of consciousness, the rise in consciousness of humanity is inevitable. Mm. And the reason why it is inevitable is because guidance is embedded in the system. Guidance is embedded in the system and the longing for a better experience is embedded in the system. So if you have those two, the longing for a better experience and the fact that there is guiding towards a more expansive reality, a more loving reality, a more compassionate reality, then it becomes inevitable. Mm. And you see it because insight is inevitable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, when, when you're uh, uh, sharing earlier, I, I I remember um, when I had an insight in the midst of a really bad flu, like I uh, had a really high fever, like I, I, and I was by myself at home and it's, uh, it was around the uh, World Cup. Um, so it was last year. And so I came back home, nobody was home. I went to my bed to sleep and rest and I, I, I had this high fever. I felt like I'm in another world. And I, I thought I'm dying. And, the, and normally I close my my door, you know, the room of, 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 of my, uh, the, the door of my room. And uh, <laughs> I did manage to get back to the door and, you know, unlock it. Uh, if something happens, you never know. And when I came back to kind of rest and sleep and I suddenly saw that I was actually 
Um, into uh, the whole movie that is happening. And I, I kind of felt that I, they call it outside, outside of body experience. I, I didn't know what that means until that day. <laughs> I literally saw myself doing that to myself. And it was like, you know, <laughs> it was like, poor you, you know, like, uh, you, you don't know what you're, you're, you're talking about, mate. You're completely fine. Like, even if you die, you know, it was such an interesting experience that um, uh, when when I came back and did the show, it was it was completely different. When I went back and did what I do with, with my clients, it's completely different. Um, so it it didn't bring me back. If if, if you know like. I mean by that it didn't bring you back it, it it I felt uh sort of an expansion really uh, you know some like what we call it maturity how oh, you're growing old but maybe I grew old in my consciousness or something <laughs> there you go so if a, if a, if a cold can teach you if a cold, a very bad cold, can bring harvest, what are you going to get wrong? Mm. But I don't wish it on anyone, really. It was a really horrible experience, you know. I know. But, but after it, I was like, I wasn't worrying at all. Like, I, I, I knew that it's going it's going to pass. You know, like, because I, it really felt like I'm going to die. Like it was a really horrible fever, Marina. Like it, it, it was that bad, and I never had this flu. Maybe I had it when I was a kid. Last time I had it, I I don't remember myself being that ill. And it was you know just a flu, but it was a really bad one, with fever and coughing. And you know I don't know anyone who has had a near death experience, like really near death illnesses and, and such you know not not like you're being gone down by a drug lord that would be very scary but i'm talking about you know in a in a in, in a completely different way once once you have had a near-death experience i don't know anyone that has been there that has not seen that ultimately you're okay regardless mm. of what you're okay And the fact that that is what everyone experiences is so comforting, no? I don't know. Me too. Not know anything. Yeah, you can't get it wrong. Mm. You can't. No matter what happens. I mean, it might not go according to your preferences, but that would not be necessarily wrong. You see? Mm. So we take another question or uh, of course, a, share, a sharing question. from... Oh, yeah, we've got Nina. I'm glad I asked. Hi, Nina. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you so much, Marina. I'm so filled up. And uh, sometimes uh, during when you are speaking, I try, oh, I have to, at least I have to remember, oh, I have to hold on this. And then I know, no, no, let it go. Just listen more and more and take it in. And I am, um, uh, my first feeling when you were speaking was, well, life becomes so much more joyful when it can't be wrong. Right, <laughs> I, and I can. I mean, playful, playful. Yes, you play with life. It doesn't. It's not. Um, I can't. If I can't do it wrong, I can just play with it. And to play, you don't want to do harm or to do anything wrong. 
necessarily when you are in the play. When you are in a play, you do it as of joy and love. Yes. So when life become more joyful because you you the fear disappear, you trust life and I get more impulsive like I do when I play. More and intuitive. That, more intuitive, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, yes, much more intuitive. But then I, I was thinking of when you said, mm, I got reminded when I was a, a child, I was growing up in a, a Christian family. And in Easter time, of course, we went to church. And I always felt so sorry for Judas, who did so the, the most wrong thing you can do. Imagine that. He did. And I felt so sorry for him. And many of, of um, I felt that the grown ups, they, they kind of, oh, Judas, he is a bad guy. He's, how could he do that? And I, I just felt, but we poor him. And I kind of already as a child, with us, I could see a kind of an innocent, uh, innocence, what is the English word? Uh, within him, yeah, that he was innocent. And now lately, when we had Easter now, just here in Norway, I was thinking, wow, where had Jesus been without Judas? Exactly. So there, there are many, many... He, he did something wrong, but the universe made this wrong action into the most loving action that has been done. And absolutely it's giving me the feeling of the university always bring a new way of look or a new ex uh, uh, as, um, ex except no um, aspect <laughs> a new aspect of life there is always love hidden or or hidden for us in the wrong yes love it's not that we we are punished or should feel shame or guilt but there is love there are accounts nina and, and not a couple like quite a few accounts in the in the apocryph in the apo apocryphous gospels yeah that turn the story completely around and say judas was the only one that loved him enough to g give him in you know, like yeah. he needed that to happen. Mm -hmm. And he asked all the apostles to bring him in. Mm -hmm. And they all were, no, no, we love you too much. We can't do that. And what, what those uh, gospels point to is the difference between attachment and love. Mm -hmm. See, so are you willing to do what is necessary even if it means that you will be judged for the rest of time. You see? It changes the perspective completely. Right? Even if it was out of love, or even if it wasn't out of love, we can recognize that it was necessary for Christ to fulfill his destiny. Yeah. Right? Because the lamb needed to be sacrificed when we we're speaking in Christian terms. Yeah. But we can take this completely different point of view to every uh, every single other tradition and understand things from a deeper perspective, right? So Baudelaire says, who in 2000 years has prayed for Satan? Yeah. Who in 2000 years has prayed for the one that needs it most? Yeah. Right? So I'm going to tell you a little a little story. One day, many years ago, in a training, um, our teacher asked us, "What is your your limit? Who are you not willing to work with?" And there was different versions of the answers. Right? People were saying, "I would not be willing to work with 
pedophiles and I would not be willing to work with rapists and I would not be willing to work with drug lords. And, and once we were all done telling who we would not work with, the one question the teacher asked was, so do you believe that you can change the world only by working with those who are moderately confused? And we were all taken aback. So if you really want to change the world, if you really want to help, you have to be willing to work with the ones that are most confused of all, the ones that are innocently suffering and imposing suffering in the world. You see? Yeah. Who are you willing to save? Now, having brought that to the table, Nina, mm -hmm. when we go back to decision-making, Divyesh, this is important. You who want to analyze all the consequences of every single decision. Yeah. Made. Yes, this is important. In a decision, the come from is infinitely more important than the outcome. Where are you making the decision from in yourself? Are you making it out of the truthfulness of who you are, your interconnectedness with the universe, your alignment with truth, the fact of abundance? Or are you making it out of fear, dependency, jealousy? Do you see? So forget for a minute all the consequences and consider where you are making the decision from. And that will give you a completely different perspective. Completely different perspective. So, for example, the, the Native American Indians, before they made any decision tribally, the elders would gather, they would speak, smoke their tobacco pipes, all the beauty of the image. But here's the thing. Every decision that the tribe made was made considering the consequences of that decision in the six following generations. Not the next six months not the next six years, the next six generations. That, to me, is proof that where they were coming from was a place of love and deep understanding, that yes, our actions have consequences. You see? And they would take all the time in the world to consider these consequences before making the decision. There was no state of anxiety in their deciding. There was no oh, suffering and frustration. No, they kept themselves at peace and just considered and reflected on it. You see the come from? So even if you can't get it wrong, there is a consideration of the come from that can change the perspective for you at any given moment. Does that make sense, Nina? Mm. Yes? Yes. Yes, I, I feel so open for life <laughs> now. And I, I, I can see the guidance and the longing for love it's everywhere. It's all. It's it's the fundament. So it can't be wrong. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So could we have uh, avoided all the suffering and the massacres and da, 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 and gotten to 
a state of enlightenment for the whole human race, a direct path? Probably. But, you know, we're human and we are caught up in this experience and we get confused and we err innocently. Yeah. We can't get it wrong because it's still inevitable. One way or another and another, any path we take will guide us yeah. back home. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. And it's also like Cohen says, uh, there is a crack in everything. There's where the light get in or or maybe get out. <laughs> that's how the light gets out. <laughs> but But that's how the light came. Yes. So even though the suffering is so sad when you see especially when you see, i see others suffer and the big suffering it's so sad but i i can feel that this sadness make me more humble and i want to bring love out i want to be loved so i uh, it seemed to be necessary kind of there you go. There you go. Remember how we were talking about confession and how we will mess up again and how you cannot become the teacher. That That is what the recognition and the sharing of your erring brings about. Mm -hmm. Compassion, mm -hmm. humility, common ground, communication, encounter. It's full of possibility. Whereas perfection isn't. <laughs> no, it goes so hard. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad that I joined this uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really glad that you joined too. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm glad I joined this. <laughs> thank you, Mumba. You're welcome. It, you know, a couple of things you said, Nina, that I do want to share with you uh, about play and about uh, light or love. The first one is, um, you reminded me of a quote by uh, uh, Stuart Brown, and he studies play. That's what he does. And he said once that play is the amount of time you spend without purpose. You know, and, you know, like it hit me really hard when I read this, because, you know, when I see kids playing, they don't have they don't have purpose. They're not, you know, trying hard to have a purpose. They, they are just there, you know, doing their thing and playing. And I want to do the same. And I, I I do the same now since I start seeing this more, because. Um, at some point, I really got serious in my head, um, and and really see, seeing that um, made total sense and brought a lot of. Um, it was an insight for me because it it really took a lot of kind of burden and seriousness and you know and BS thinking out of my head, you know. Um, and the second thing is uh, when he said uh, something about love, I did remember, I, I read this somewhere, but it, it's really uh, something that uh, sticked with me, that um, there is nothing but light, or darkness is not a color. Darkness is just the description of the absence of light. And there is nothing but love. Anything else is just a description to to describe the absence of love. But love is all always there. Wisdom is always there. Um, consciousness, every, truth is, is always there, you know? It's truth, isn't it? The truth. Mm. You know, <clears throat> one of my kids, when he was younger, 
he was very obsessed with winning, very. So he would take his play very seriously. <laughs> Whenever we were, you know, playing a board game or anything with his brothers, he was very serious about winning. Whereas his other two brothers were completely careless about winning or not. And that allowed them to enjoy the play. Mm. Whereas he didn't. You see? So you can have a thousand different game board games and every one of them will tell a different story and will have a different purpose or goal or rules or but ultimately that is the purpose or the goal of the small game the big goal of every single one of those games is to bring people together around a table and have a good time and if you get too lost in the little game you lose sight of the big game of life. Mm. So I have a friend who tells me, well, you know, I roll the dice and I fell on the on the divorce spot. I guess that is up for me in my life. But my sister rolled the dice and she fell on the slot of cancer and that's her life. And my friend rolled the dice and she fell on the slot for the lottery. And I guess that's what, what is up in her life right now. But as long as you keep rolling the dice, you keep moving. You keep experiencing. You keep harvesting. It's not that big of a deal when you look at the big game of life. Mm -hmm. No? And that lightness allows for more love, allows for more compassion, allows for more encounter, connection, insight, joy. One. Can, can I just add a quick one, Mar Marina and Omar? Yeah, yesterday, yeah. this guy, Sadhguru, whose quotes are quite wise. I mean, like, I say, I get one in my email. And he said something. I, I don't know whether it links with what you're saying, Marina, but he, he said that the real wealth in life is not money, but the profoundness of experience. I think it, it just resonated. What I don't know what you were saying just now. It just resonated. The, prof the, vera the various profoundness of experiences is the opening for richness of your being so yeah exactly so we spend we spend our lives trying to avoid uncomfortable experiences without realizing that having all experiences is the richness of our lives yes right like <clears throat> if you were given the chance to not feel sad ever again in your life, would you take it? Nope. There you go. How would you know happiness? Exactly. You see, so and and there is so much depth and beauty and exquisiteness in sadness at the same time. There are depths that you cannot reach any other way. And so a rich life implies the whole of the specter of human experience, not only mm -hmm. half of it. Yeah, yeah. It is just that we have learned to fear the other half because we believe it says something about us. Oh, if you feel anger, that's because you're a bad person. You're not trustworthy. Oh, if you feel sad, it's because you are not grateful enough. Oh, if you are frustrated, it's because you're not mature enough. You see? Boys don't cry. No. There is nothing to fear in feeling. It is what brings the rich chance of life. But we are so desperately trying to run away from it to keep it hidden. Mm. Uh, we just experience more and more and more frustration because we are trying to manage and control something that is completely natural. 
completely natural. And not only natural, it is guidance for Christ's sake, right? It's the most precious tool we have in our guidance. It speaks yeah. feeling. Why would you not want to experience it? Well, I have my own reasons, Marina. Well, <laughs> I will trust you with them, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can't get it wrong, so you can choose to whatever you want. <laughs> Yes, right. I forgot that one. <laughs> Marina, thank you. Uh, this has been amazing. But um, I think uh, it, it, it's um, it's it's time to let this sink in. You know. Um. Gosh, uh, that's what I was talking about. <clears throat> Sorry. That's what I was talking about at the beginning. I said that Marina always brings me into that space and it's it's a such a treat to experience that. And now I hope you guys see what I'm talking about. I can see some faces beaming. Yes. Thumbs up. Great. Thank you, Marina, for um, you know, for coming on and, and just sharing uh generously and beautifully, uh always from you know. Uh, deep inside your your soul, I feel that. Um, always a pleasure to hear you share, uh, and to share this space with you. So thank you very much, and thank you guys for coming on. Yeah, even if some of you it's late, um, um, and and some of it's early morning, but yeah, Divyas, maybe you should move uh back to the UK or something, mate. <laughs> no, no, no. I am happy here. <laughs> But I want to visit Mexico just to visit Marina. I mean, I really would love to visit Mexico City and have a few sessions. I mean, it's just amazing the the feeling. Not in Mexico just... City, Divyesh. I mean, Querétaro, but it's much prettier than Mexico City. Believe me, you'll love it. So, uh, I'm planning to come over. Look out for me, Marina. Great. Right. <laughs> no. Yes. For me too. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, all of us. Yes. Yeah, if you think all of us gonna, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's it's in my head, so oh, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely. Thank you guys. Thank you. And I'll Thank I'll you. see Hello. you. Um. Yeah, I think yeah. next week we're gonna have another one. So this month is gonna be full of sessions. Um, to catch up with last month, and uh, and and also to, you know, uh, give to the community really. Um, I love doing this uh, beside the podcast that I'm doing with Keith. Uh, but yeah, I, I love doing that and, and bringing on guests and and um, just sharing. So I'll see you next week. Thank you, Thank Omar. Bye-bye. Right, and again, Eid Mubarak. Thank Eid you. Mubarak. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.